So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy to welcome you here this evening. I'm really thrilled that Terry is here from France. He sent me all his stuff. I had a very exciting time with customs, and this has been a real adventure all the way around. But I think I was, I was really pleased to see how the show looks. And um, very pleased also that many other people are fascinated by the paintings, and I'm happy to say we've had a lot of sales. So that's a good thing. Not as happy as I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think everybody knows Terry, so I don't have to do all this stuff like saying he was. He has this great resume as an educator and artist former director of the Stellar Center, and now spends a lot of time in France painting these beautiful landscapes, and that's what the landscape looks like. So um, I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to let Terry talk to you. He has a little handout. I'm going to try to answer the question that I've been asking myself for the better part of a century. I'm not at all sure that I've correctly answered it. And I'm going to do it by going through history and telling you what some great thinkers thought about art, and then leave it up to you. This particular lecture is a Reader's Digest version of a course that I've been teaching now for over 50 years, so I don't need notes. Uh, I actually am very bad memory now, you know, it's going, but uh, somehow I can teach a whole course without looking at notes, because, and I have a theory that if you understand something, you can't forget it, and that's what's happened. So I'm going to start uh, with Plato. There was art, of course, before the Greeks, lots of it, especially in Egypt. And Egyptian art is very symbolic. That is to say, it, it refers to a religious system, and if you don't know the system, you can't decode it. For example, if you see a, uh, a human figure with a head of a hawk or an eagle, you don't know what that means, or a sphinx. So you see the object, but you, it refers outside itself. So what this great art that they did for 5,000 years. They didn't say what it was. Was it art? Of course. So it doesn't matter what you define it as, and, or whether you have the right definition. But the first definition of art came with the Greeks. And because the Greeks invented philosophy, so Socrates died in uh, 399, and it's 399, or, yeah, 399. The death of Socrates and is second in the West, anyway, in importance maybe to the death of Christ. So while he was dying, he said he sang his swan song, and Plato was there. Plato knew him. Plato was his student. And whether they were in love in that sense, although that wouldn't have been impossible in old Greece. Nobody knows, but they certainly were, uh, Plato loved him very much and watched him die. So Socrates never wrote anything, and he was himself an artist, a sculptor, but we have nothing that he, that he ever did. So to understand what Plato said, you have to understand a little bit about Plato's philosophy. And what Plato did was invent, he, he discovered what we now call the universal. So he said that because we only experience individual things, incidentally my teaching method is Socratic. So if anybody has a question, please ask it right before the lecture's over, while it's in your mind. And I'll answer it. If I don't think it's for the good of the whole people, I'll say, well, let's wait till after you talk about that. But in any case, he, he, he looked at the world and said, well, I only in experience individual trees. 
but I have a concept of treeness. Because I say, this is a tree and that's a tree, but neither of them is the universal tree. So he said, since we do not experience with our senses any such thing as the universal, they must exist in some other place, which is now referred to as the heaven of ideas. So for every class of things in this world, trees, flowers, houses, clouds, there's a universal concept. Not in this world, but in the heaven of ideas. He said you get to that. And he discovered that the, the mind of man is in contact with some suprasensible reality. And this suprasensible reality revealed to him as Socrates was dying that there's life after death. Because although I, you can kill the body, you can't kill the mind. That's actually Plato's, that's the first proof or attempt at proof. It doesn't really work, but it's an attempt at proof at immortality. That part of us is indestructible. You can't kill the mind. Because universals can't be cut. Right? So we're in touch so this is where the whole notion of body and soul came in. And that notion that we have a body and a soul, which everybody takes for granted and thinks is Christian, is not Christian at all. There's no such uh, distinction in Ju Judeo-Christian literature. We're just one flesh, they call it. But in, he invented the distinction between body and soul. And so the body, of course, will die everybody's but mine. <laughs> and the soul will live on and get in touch with the universal. So he then asked the question, well, how did the world get here? Plato did. He said, well, of course, it's long before Copernicus, so they all thought everything was Earth-centered. And there's a whole history of philosophy before Plato called the pre-Socratics. And they always ask the same question. The same question that's being asked now, but apparently has been recently solved with the discovery of the, the uh, God principle, the Hogs. Higgs. Higgs. What? Higgs, Higgs. particle. The Higgs. Higgs particle. Higgs particle. Mm -hmm. Which is really matter. So way back in Greece, they said, well, ev the, everything is different, but everything's the same. So Urstoff, they called it, or the Germans used that word matter stuff, clay, this eternal clay was always here, was uncreated. And he got to God as the good, which is an ultimate abstraction. So how does the, do the ideas get stuck in the earth? He says, well, he postulates a demiurge, he called it. And it's the first uh, time in history that he came up with the notion of a divine artist. So the demiurge in Plato is a postulated being between God, the good, and us, the earth. And the demiurge, all eternity, looks and sees the universal ideas in God's mind and puts them, uses this eternal stuff or clay and makes the forms. And each form keeps reproducing itself but of course there was no evolution. So trees make trees and lions make lions and it goes on forever. But the original form in the world of a tree uh, would have been in the mind of God. So already the trees in this world are imitations. So nature he said, is the given, just as we say, the world we live in, the earth and the trees and the human bodies and all. And he came up with the first definition of art, and it's very powerful. Art is the imitation of nature. That Plato's definition of art. But you say, well, that's not so hot because, look, but think of Venus de Milo, right? She's the perfect woman, not just a woman. It's the universal woman that the, the artist was looking for. But it's a copy of a copy. 
So if you take Plato seriously, he, he loved art, he knew art, and he wanted in his educational theory all students to be educated in art because he thought it made people more civilized and, and was a pro pudic to uh, thinking. Right? So music especially, he felt, should be studied and that would lead to mathematics. And of course there is a relationship. So it's the first one, the imitation of nature. Now you could go on and on in this, and I could make the rest of the lecture that way, but I'm not going to. It's just one definition. And it matches Greek art. Because the, you take Venus de Milo or Praxiteles, you know, the, the uh, discus thrower, or any, we don't have any paintings from Greece. Uh, none, none were left. But we have what they must have been like from Pompeii. So uh, the whole Greek uh, aesthetic seemed to be art is the imitation of nature. Now this has a hold on the imagination in the West. Nobody in Africa, nobody in China, nobody in India ever thought of art that way. Nobody in Egypt. They weren't imitating nature at all. They weren't imitating anything. They were trying to sim express some idea in some medium. Now, Plato was the student of Socrates, and Plato had one very good student uh, whose name turned out to be Aristotle. And Aristotle uh, broke with Plato and said, there is no heaven of ideas. But that's purely Plato's made it up. He said, we don't need it. And he, and he invented abstraction. So he said, what we do is we see an individual tree here and an individual tree there. We leave out the individuating notes, is what he calls them. And we conceive the universal through the power of the mind. He calls it the agent intellect. And it's a very strange kind of Rube Goldberg theory of epistemology, which doesn't work either. But he looked at art differently because he didn't see art, even though he takes over Plato's definition, he doesn't see it as the imitation of nature. He sees it as a getting at the essence of things. Uh, and so Aristotle really had a different view of nature, more akin to a scientific view, although it really wasn't scientific. But he said the what the artist does, he gets at the universal, right? He tries to get at the essential form. For example, going back, Venus de Milo. The form of woman. The form. Now, most of these statues were of gods. So you have Apollo Belvedere, you have Venus de Milo. They were the perfect... <coughs> they were after the perfect form, the essential form of woman, the essential tree, the essential anything. And the essence of something is what we're doing. So he, he uh, takes over the definition, but he means something totally different by it. And the art that he was most concerned with and wrote most extensively about was theater. And he wrote a wonderful book uh, on poetry, it's called, but it's really about how to write a play. And it's still a good book if you want to know how to write a play. It, it reads very well, and it says it should all take place in, in one day and have one action, gives you all sorts of good rules that apply. For example, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Edward Albee's play, which just opens a huge, beautiful review in New York. It all follows the Greek uh, model. So does uh, uh, Death of a Salesman. And that's from Aristotle. And what he says that the playwright is trying to do, again, is get at the essence of things. This is what what Shakespeare later in the Renaissance will say is the playwright holds the mirror up to nature. So he makes art the same definition, but it means it seems to be more important to me because he's saying the artist is trying to get at the essence of something. He's trying to get at the universal. And, and aren't we? Uh, you know, a lot of artists in the world makes a lot of sense. The artist reveals something essential, and it's akin to trying to get at form. What 
later when da Vinci starts drawing, you know he did all those drawings, hundreds, thousands of them. He didn't think they were art. He wasn't interested. He was a scientist. He was trying to get at the essence of the form. And although he was doing it with the body, dissecting them and drawing them, and, and he wrote the first medical illustrations and all that, he was trying to get at the essence of stuff. Not a, different than a, a, bi, a, a biologist today with a microscope, because what does reveal the essence of something, whether it be a bacteria, is its form, right? One has to have a different form than the other. So it's quite profound in a way. They had no idea of microscopes, but he, he would, was saying that art is a very important way for us to get at the essence of, of reality by the imitation. The Greek word is mimesis, which isn't quite imitation. It's reflection. It's getting back. So this is the same definition. And again, Plato, Aristotle, and everybody after, right through Rome, because uh, Aristotle taught Alexander the Great, and the tradition came down. When the Roman Empire became powerful, all Romans spoke Greek. And they absorbed Greek culture. What they added were architectural things, engineering, like domes and uh, aqueducts. So the Greek, Greco-Roman culture, which lasted a thousand years, that's where Hitler got his idea, the German Reich will last a thousand years from Rome. It did, it lasted a thousand years, about exactly a thousand years. And uh, it was all the same art, which you see all over the place, classical art. You can see it in Greece, you can see it in Rome, you can see it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, right here in New York. Sculptors still do it, and it's still a valid way of doing it. One of the things I want to say in this, as I go through this long evolution, nothing's in, in Hegel, who's my he hero, says that in the evolution of art, or any kind of evolution, or growth, nothing is lost. That is, any preceding art is raised up and included in the next. So when we get to modern art, we haven't lost Greek art. There's still very good realistic artists in this world. It's still a very, very valid way to paint, to sculpt. We use their form sometimes in architecture. Music, we don't have that much because there was no written music until about 800. So we don't know what their music really sounded like. The dance, they certainly had, but we don't know what that looked like, except on the Greek vases. And but the whole culture held together, and it's very different from the culture, say, in Japan or India or Africa or or uh, America at the time. They were they were not into it, but it has a hold on us. So that that it's kind of like the art, it's this Greco-Roman Western art that we're the uh, that we have inherited. In any case. That definition wasn't challenged, and this civilization lasted for a long time. Am I being clear? Is anybody about to faint with <laughs> boredom yet? No, no, no. no laughs yet. <coughs> I can't have to think of a joke. Huh? Somebody said, why do you still teach after 50 years? I said, well, I can't think of any more new jokes, so I have to get a new audience every year. <laughs> uh, the big break with Greco-Roman art and art as the imitation of nature came from Christianity. And Christianity came out of Judaism, and Jesus, as you know, was a Jew and never wanted to start a new church. He just wanted to kind of reform Judaism, where it would be simpler to become a member because it's a lot easier to get baptized and circumcised, especially for an adult. <laughs> and uh, there were other differences, but that what happened is he, he did start it. And men started it, and enlightened men, and good men, and I don't want to go into it. It's not a, the, a, 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 uh, a lecture on theology. But whatever happened, and however it happened, it spread like wildfire, this new form of Judaism. 
were simpler to get in. They didn't have as many rules uh, in terms of diet and all that. And anyway, it they had the the apostles were very very powerful men who really believed, and they were able to go through the Roman Empire, which was the whole Mediterranean basin, in very short order for three reasons. Every first of all, the Jews were all Roman citizens because everybody who was in the Roman Empire was a Roman citizen. The Romans were very clever in their occupation. Uh, they, uh, they let people kind of remain the way they were. They, they didn't tell all the Jews to stop being Jews or stop speaking Hebrew, but everybody learned <coughs> Latin. But mostly all of the cultured people all spoke Greek. So when St. Paul, for example, went on his missionary effort throughout the empire and all the other ones, and they'd go to a synagogue in uh, Antioch or uh, in Spain, any place where they were, because the Jews had the diaspora, they were all over the Mediterranean basin. He would speak Greek. They all spoke Greek. So, and you, I suppose you know that all of the New Testament is in Greek, except uh, for St. Matthew was written in Aramaic. But all of it was in classical Greek. So they spoke the language, they were citizens, so they didn't need a passport, and it was one empire. And the world was at, basically at peace during the time of Augustus when Christ was born. So it spread, and it spread very, very rapidly. The Romans didn't like it because it was very clear that the emperor wasn't a god. And that you couldn't have monotheism either the Judaic kind or the Christian kind, and still hold on to all the Greek gods. So the way the Greeks were able to depict God, Venus and Apollo and all of those wonderful gods that we know from mythology, is they, they broke God up into many gods who were really kind of superhumans, supermen, superwomen, and they had commerce with them. You know, they had even sexual relations. You know, you had half gods, and it's all very interesting. And naughty, naughty, but those gods weren't so hot. But anyway, the new, the new one made more sense, and they built, the fathers of the church took Plato and Aristotle, and what theology became was thinking out the message of the Old and the New Testament in Platonic terms or in Aristotelian terms. Right? That's what theology is. So they said, well, what does it mean? And then they would use Platonic philosophy or Aristotelian philosophy. In any case, it spread like wildfire. And to make a very long story short, by 300 it had spread so it had permeated the empire and Constantine, the emperor, in the year 312 actually, was converted to Christianity. And in, there was a battle. And he, before the battle, He's supposed to have prayed to God to help him, and he saw the sign of the cross in the heavens, right? In hoc signo, in this sign you will conquer. And that gave him the courage, and he won the battle. And he then got converted. But it wasn't that simple. His mother was already converted, so I think there was a little pressure on him. And he did become converted, and in very short order, I mean within months, years, didn't just make it legal to be a Christian. He made it the state religion. That was the beginning of the end for... We're still struggling with that one, aren't we? Separation of church and state. Forget about it. It stopped with Constantine. And it didn't start again until our revolution. We're the ones that... We, we, we did that before the French. Uh, Jefferson. Major, major breakthrough. But you still have, we, we still have this big problem of the separation of church and state. Anyway, Constantine said, this is the religion. And he wanted everybody to think the same way. So he's the one that called the first council of the church in Nicaea in 325, which is in the Middle East. And he said, okay, you guys can be bishops and you're big cheeses and that's wonderful, but I'm the, I'm the emperor. And I want you all to agree. I don't want disunity in my empire. 
So they came up with this idea that everybody had to think exactly the same way. And in the council, the bishops that didn't agree with the majority were banished. Some of them killed, and that's when heresy began and all that. But the state notion of the state religion came there. In any case, once that happened, culturally, all hell broke loose because the Greek uh, and Roman aesthetic no longer fit. You weren't going to have temples with beautiful nudes all around in, in Christianity. And you started to create a new kind of art, which again lasts about a thousand years. So from 300 to 1300, we have the early medieval period and then the middle one and the high Middle Ages, the 13th century, with Chart and uh, Notre Dame and all this great Gothic art. Right? But that was all Christian art, so practically all of the art. I would say 95% of the art from 300 to 1300 is religious art right? and is Christian art. Because Christian was the, it was the state religion and it was before Protestantism, so everybody thought the same thing. And you had the, the Pope was, the, they, they referred to this period as uh, Papo Caesarism. The kings in Europe didn't think that they got their power. I don't know if you've ever, where did the divine right of kings came from? The Pope, Charlemagne in 8, 800, when had, felt it necessary to go to Rome to get crowned to legitimize his power. And that ha kept going until Napoleon in 1800 in Europe. The kings all felt that their, their divine right came somehow through the church. But Charlemagne was crowned in Aachen. No, he lived in Aachen. That was his... Uh, seat of power. He, he went to Rome. That's what's so significant about it in 800. And a thousand years later, Napoleon, when he decided he wanted to be emperor and no longer the first consul, really <laughs> kidnapped the Pope. He got the Pope invited him anyway. But, you know, he better come or else because Napoleon was the most powerful man in Europe. Had the coronation in Notre Dame. We had that great picture of David of the, in, in uh, the Louvre enormous picture of the coronation, all in the imitation of nature style that they say after the Revolution. But when the Pope went to put the crown on his head, he took it from him, put it on his own head. <coughs> and that, that was the end of it. Christianity never had any more the same kind of power as it had uh, had, had before that. It was a great symbolic gesture. But in any case, the art in the Middle Ages is very different. So uh, the first one to, to bring up the subject of what is art is a philosopher named Plotinus, who was a Neoplatonist who wrote about the same time as Augustine, about the 4th century. And he created a kind of pantheism where he said that because art was so different, so now we've got to focus, we're not thinking of Greek art like Venus de Milo, but of Gothic art, <coughs> like the windows in Chart, where no, nothing is imitation has nothing to do with it. It's all trying to symbolize something. So they're trying to to, to uh, illustrate the Bible is what, what the whole thing is. And why? Well, the revelation that they all believed in, and everybody did, was in a book. So you couldn't see it. So to make, and, and a lot of people couldn't read anyway. Only the monks and and so they, really, all of the art becomes an illustration of the, of the Bible. In short, the entire Old and New Testament are in the windows, if you take the trouble to look. Uh, I mean, it would be very difficult, because you, know, you have to look very high up, but there it is, you know. From, and you have Gardens of Eden, and Noah's Ark, and right along with the crucifixion, and the resurrection, and, 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 and wonderful all sorts of miracles and all this stuff. It, it's a complete illustration of the Bible, medieval art. Also the, the wonderful books that the monks did. And what was going on? Well, uh, again, in a, in a lecture like this, I have to be, you know, it's a snapshot. But what happened is I think that the view was then, and probably with a lot of Christians right now, 
uh, that there's history and then there's salvation history. That however the world was made, God made it. And it went on and would go on forever the same way. And of course the sun went around the earth. So they had this wonderful man-centered universe. But what really didn't matter the real history was salvation history. And salvation history began when God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. And with it came suffering and the kind of life we have. But when he kicked them out, he promised a redeemer. So the beginning was Adam and Eve. The middle was the birth of Christ, the redeemer. This is Christian belief. And the end will be when he comes again. So if the end of life as I was taught uh, as a kid, and maybe some of you were too in catechism, is to know, love, and serve God in this world and be happy with him in the next. That's the way what we learned in the Baltimore Catechism. Then what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? I mean, what do you want a hedge fund for? The main thing is to keep your nose clean and make damn sure that before you die, you're in the state of grace, so you go to heaven and not to hell. And they all believed in heaven and hell, and they started depicting it. They were in horrible terms of torture and in hell and purgatory, all sorts of other lesser tortures, but at least they ended. And then heaven, wow, great. Right? It's, all, it's all in the windows, it's all there. Right? Now, this call for a different, it didn't look like the world anymore. So Platonus says, well, this kind of art that you see in these churches isn't imitating nature. And who cares about nature anyway? It's supernature we're, we're worried about. So he says art isn't an imitation of nature. It's a direct uh, line. Like nature is, God is the divine artist. Nature is his art. But our God also works through the intelligence of gifted human beings, and they make art, but you don't compare the two. Both of them reveal uh, the, the divinity. So, it, to sum it up, they thought that the first revelation was in nature, God's art. And this whole notion of God as a divine artist goes all the way back to Plato. Everybody thought it. And, and still do sometimes. I don't know even how many times I do. But anyway, art doesn't imitate nature for them. It, it's a, a direct, revel, a second revelation of this artist, right? So he was a, he did nature and that wasn't good enough. He improved on himself and made supernature. And the second revelation is in the Bible, but it, you can't see it or hear it. So they made art to symbolize it. And he calls art a an emanation of divine beauty, a separate emanation. Much more important was St. Thomas Aquinas, because Plotinus was in the beginning, right? And then there are lots of other lesser things. But St. Thomas Aquinas, who lived in the 13th century, was really a great genius besides being a, a, a Dominican monk. And he was so smart, they took him up from Italy and he went to Paris and he was buddies with the king. He was also very so fat that they had to uh, carve a half moon out of the table. It's funny, but we don't think of uh, obese people as smart, but they're, they're very, very smart. And he was, he was, he's up there and reputed by all philosophers as one of the great thinkers of all time. And he created many, many books that much. But the great book is the Summa Theologica, which, uh, in which he tried to do to philosophy what the cathedrals had done, which was make an, an enormous structure that covered all philosophy and theology. And theology was the queen of the sciences, uh, although it wasn't science at all, of course. And philosophy was next. So he brings up the subject of art, and he looked around, and he didn't see as the art of the time the same kind of art that the Greek thinkers saw. Venus de Milo and the discus thrower and that sort of thing. He saw stained glass windows, 
and uh, great cathedrals and the marvelous books illustrated by the monks. And he saw that they made it all with their hands. And also noticed, because he, he was there when Notre Dame was being built, uh, it was all done at the same time. It was an amazing century. Shark and Notre Dame were the same architect. Uh, that they were craftsmen. And none of the artists in the Middle Ages that we know of thought of themselves as having egos. They all did it out of belief. All that great sculpture, for example, on the tympanum of Shard, there are hundreds of sculptures of saints and apostles and uh, Christ and Mary and everything. It's Notre Dame de Shard, of course. Uh, and they don't look realistic. They're all elongated and all the rest of it. And not one of them is signed. They haven't got one name. They all did it, but they, and it was art, but they didn't think of it as art. They thought of it as craft. They were doing it with their hands. So Thomas comes up with the fourth definition of art, or the third, and a very important one. He says, art is a habit of the practical intellect. That's his definition of art. Interesting. That is, the, he made a distinction between the speculative intellect, where you're just thinking about being and like philosophers, and the practical intellect, like a somebody making a pot or making a statue or making the stained glass window. And he said, this is a craft. It's something to do with the mind and the hand. And he called it a habit, something you learn. And they had the gills, and they all learned these wonderful crafts. And there is something to that. So I'm going to, again, remind you what I said in the beginning. This truth in all of this, art can be the imitation of nature. It can be the the, a habit of the practical intellect, because we all know you have to practice. It doesn't come that easily. Once in a while you'll get a primitive painter like Rousseau, uh, who's great, or Grandma Moses, who doesn't follow the rules. But that doesn't mean they don't have skills. It just means they're not following certain rules. So that's a, a pretty good definition, and it matches the art of the time. That's what I'm leading up to, is that the theories about art, artists in general then and artists now, don't give a, uh, a hoot for what philosophers and theologians say about art. They just do it. They might. They might read the critics, but then they think they're full of beans anyway. And they're always ahead of the critics. So that went on, and uh, then the Renaissance came. And the Renaissance started in the 14th century in Florence, really, they, uh, in Italy. And they kind of it's interesting to me, the Renaissance, as a, uh, having studied philosophy and theology as well as art, that people always say, well, the Renaissance was humanism, just like the Greek the rediscovery of Greek and Roman humanism. In a sense, it was. Right? They did rediscover all of the old uh, techniques and even the art of Greek, Greece, and Rome. And they said, this is really beautiful stuff. And then they started to do it. Uh, and they discovered not just their art, but, uh, I mean, their visual art or, or plastic arts, but they discovered their, their uh, thinkers like Vitruvius, uh, who was an engineer and, and an architect in Rome, discovered all of the old uh, techniques of how they put up these temples and all, and they, but but and it is humanism, and it was the discovery of the individual. But they, I, I, the big difference is it was a change not in philosophy. All of the people in the Renaissance, all of them, were believers. They might not have been holy ones, but they were all Christians. And they all were believers. They all accepted the same vision of life that St. Thomas outlines in the Summa Theologica. And if you read, if you can get through Dante, I never was able to get through the whole thing, but it, it's really an illustration of St. Thomas Aquinas' uh, Summa Theologica. Right? So they all have this said, but why does the art change? Well, they switched their attitude. And they said, okay, God became man. 
So maybe man's pretty good. And if God became man, so man could become God. So we're going to depict Christ no longer as a symbol, kind of with not using perspective at all, but as the perfect man. And you start at the first image, and then, of course, you couldn't count them, uh, the crucifixes, and Christ gets to be. And think of all the images that in the Renaissance, you know, of Michelangelo. It's David isn't just a, a very well-formed nude male. It's David. You know, it's David and Goliath. Right? It's, again, a, a religious uh, statue, his, his pieta. He, did, he started to do some secular ones, but the, the most famous ones are all, in one sense or another, related to great Moses, which he did later, he, he said speak, is, again, like Greek or Roman art. So that definition, here, you put the two together and you get Renaissance art. It's the imitation of nature in the sense that it's getting at the essence of things. But it's also craft. And they had very, very strong, powerful guilds that the artists belonged to. The one I know most about, because I, I've been teaching for, uh, for a few years and happened to live near where he was, where he lived and was buried, is, is Da Vinci. And Da Vinci was is the Renaissance artist. He's the Renaissance man. And he embodies it. And he started to do more secular things, like the Mona Lisa. But... His most famous work, of course, was The Last Supper, and he changes it. So Da Vinci really understood. He, he read it. He was very, very smart. He was self-educated. He couldn't be educated formally because he was uh, illegitimate. He was the first child of his father. He had, I think, 10 or 11 uh, half-brothers and sisters, none of whom became as powerful. But he was the firstborn in the family. And his father was well-to-do. He was a, a, not a notary public, but in France, even today, the notaries are pretty powerful people. And he put him in uh, a, as an apprentice to Verrocchio. And when he was 13, he posed for uh, Verrocchio's famous statue of David. That, that's a, a portrait of, of da Vinci. When he was 21, he did his first paint, solo painting which is the Annunciation. And when Verrocchio saw it and sold it at a high price, it's in the Uffizi now, he said, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to stick to sculpture. Let him do the painting. I'll make more money that way. He didn't do many paintings. He didn't last very long with Verrocchio. He started his own studio and became Da Vinci, you know, the, the Renaissance man. When he was drawing, he was doing what a scientist does in biology in a microscope. Yeah. He was trying to, he thought that you, if you got the essence of the body, you would understand it. The beginning, and that's true. So he dissected, and he never thought all of these incredible drawings were art. He thought it was science. He thought of himself as a science, a scientist. And he has a famous quote where he says, listen to this one, the divinity which resides in the science of the artist transforms the mind of the artist into a similitude of the divine mind. And he didn't add it, but he meant it, because if you keep going, you know he meant it. Before the creation of the world, so he's saying that when you draw a tree right, and you get you master it and you get it in your head, right, you're transforming your mind into God's mind before the creation of the world because God had a vision of the world before he created it. So they stuck Plato's ideas in God's head and said God looks at them. He makes the world. Let there be a world the way it is. And the artist, by observing it, transforms his mind into the mind of God before the creation of the world, right? and then puts it out again 
And if you look at his paintings, for example, the first one, The Annunciation, he was a botanist. There's something like 25 or 30 different flowers that they're all identified. And in his house in France, they've created a garden with all of the herbs and flowers and plants that da Vinci put in his painting. But they're real now. They're, they're all there. And he felt that that was necessary. But then he puts it out again. And he creates another world. What world? The world of da Vinci. We even use that title. Don't we? You say the world of Leonardo da Vinci. You get a perfectly clear picture. It's style. So the individual really means something here. I mean, Christ, whatever else he was, was a very, very distinct individual person. And the notion that man has this consciousness and this destiny to become gods in some way after death right, makes gives him a certain dignity. So he created the world of da Vinci, very different from the world of Michelangelo, who had another style or Botticelli, or any of these big names. But no, we're in the Renaissance. You know all the names, and they wanted you to. But that wasn't an irreligious act. They were saying you give more glory to God if you become, it's the beginning of this notion, a good human being. Not so dumb. So the art is still religious, but somehow it, little by little, transforms itself and becomes more secular. For example, if you walk into uh, Chartres, that's a memory of Chartres, I, you, you, even if you're not a believer, you get a certain sense of transcendence. Henry Adams wrote a book, I think he almost was converted to Catholicism by the experience of being in church. It's very religious, it's very transcendent. When you go in St. Peter's, which is the great Renaissance Baroque temple, it's magnificent, but it's like a big palace. It's very opulent. It's like for Louis XIV would be happy in there. And of course, Louis XIV got that way, you know? Megalomania is what took over. In any case, in the Renaissance, the this is my own words, and you can challenge me or ask questions about it. A new definition of art comes in. So if you have it, first is the imitation of nature, and then sort of emanation of divine beauty with Plotinus, and then more importantly, a habit of the practical intellect. In the Renaissance, they saw it, I think, as an imitation of the divine creative process. The, the artists thought of themselves as really very special people who were creating worlds of style, right? They're unmistakable. Da Vinci didn't even uh, sign who knew they know who they were. And you would. They were all very distinct. So I think they were, those people were just as religious, but in a very different way. They were humanist, but they thought that... So, this is a, a quote from a, uh, I think it's St. Thomas, I forget. Man be, a God became man, so man could become God. And there is a kind of megalomania in, in the late Renaissance art that holds on. And that keeps going until what happens is next. Right? So the imitation of the divine creative process is not such a dumb idea for those who believe in God, or even if you don't, when you think that you're using this word, so it's the first time I've used it, creation. They started thinking of art as creation. The Greeks never thought of it as creation. That's, they thought that was irrational, making something out of nothing. That's what creation is. Thomas skirts the issue. I don't know about that, but I know you have to use your hands. You can't make a painting without it, and you better train them so that your your hand follows your mind and does what you what you want it to do. Anyway, then came the Reformation and the Age of Reason. With Descartes was the big daddy. There were others. There were scientists, but it was really Descartes who, in France, who 
question the whole thing and, in fact, throws out the Thomistic view and starts to use reason alone, right? But this is that what Hegel called the Zeitgeist. It was the time. Galileo had already happened. Copernicus, Gal Galileo, was the age of science, and they were beginning, especially in France, to get interested in nature. And they weren't just seeing nature as a... They weren't seeing the world as a, a stage on which the drama of salvation was played. They saw somehow the world as important in itself. And they wanted to understand it without revelation. And science comes along, and Descartes says, I'm not going to take... He was studied with the Jesuits, a very successful student of the Jesuits at La Fleche, one of the great Jesuit schools in France in the 17th century. And he said, I'm leaving the country, and I'm going alone, and I'm going to think out the world with no revelation. Not scientifically, however, that comes a little later, but philosophically. So, of course, he said, I think, therefore I am, and he came up with his whole philosophy there. And he looked around. By this time, because of the Protestant Reformation, in Protestant Europe, so northern Germany, Holland, England, parts of France, but in the air, <coughs> pardon me, the thinkers like Luther, but most of all Calvin, went against all this imagery. They were iconoclasts, right? And so they began to question this tr tradition of religious art, which by this time had gone on from 300 through the Renaissance to 1600. And you have all these churches, the Baroque churches in, in the 16th, 17th century, with thousands of angels and flying up to heaven and trompe l'oeil ceilings and all this stuff. And they said, no, this distracts you from any kind of real communion with God. Let's get rid of it. And they really did. The one that stands out in my mind as an experience is the Ulm Cathedral in Ulm, Germany. It's a perfectly beautiful Gothic cathedral, which during this time, they took all of the stained glass away, all of the statues, and it's just there. And it's actually astounding. And here in our country, uh, there's something about a Quaker meeting house at the, the end product of this. It's saying you don't want to be distracted by all this. And the art that becomes paramount in the Protestant uh, uh, Europe is music, which, which goes to the moon and at, that, at that time. because. They play that, and you play the hymns, and they're all about the words. So at the Reformation, and let's say 1519, but by the time of Descartes, it had already gone into Europe all over the place. He was in a Catholic country, but he went to Holland. And he was trying to... They got, the Jesuits condemned him. He was put on the index. He was very friendly with them. They liked him very much. They just were very afraid of this philosophy because he was not being subservient and obedient to the church authorities. And they said he was a heretic. So he, when it comes to art, so he, he said, his own, if by reason alone, we can get to God. It doesn't work, but he said you can. But really, he goes back to Platonic dualism. And he said there's, there's mind and there's matter. And mind, you, you know that something is true if you have a clear and distinct idea of it. I never quite understood what the hell that means, but I do now. What scientists would say now is you only know it's true if you can prove it with a, an experiment. So E equals MC squared, we know that's true because we blew up <coughs> Hiroshima. You know, and that's the way the mind started to work there. But when it comes to art, it's not a clear and distinct idea. So he comes up with another definition of art. Art is the expression of emotion. And he defined emotion as a, a, 
uh, a fuzzy idea. It's not clear and distinct. So you have art, people looking at as an expression of emotion. In Protestant Europe, they get rid of it all. They, they, it's iconoclasm. And in Catholic Europe, who are trying to go against this idea, it becomes more flamboyant. The entire South America, Mexico, Vienna, uh, not South America, Viennese, uh, I don't know why, but that's also Baroque, but it's the, the wrong connection at the moment. Whenever the missionaries went out, they were Catholic missionaries for the 17th century, and they put this Baroque art into South America, wherever they went in the world. And it's all over your Vienna, Vienna is, a, is a Baroque city, architecturally. So, art is the expression of emotion, and in the Catholic countries it becomes more and more emotional. And the way I keep it in my mind is Rubens and Rembrandt, who are contemporaries. Rubens is... I mean, he must have had a hundred assistants, that guy. I mean, you go all over, you have one huge painting after another. I don't know if he went and said, mm, I guess that's okay. He couldn't have done it. <laughs> but they're Rubenesque, right? So he had these got these robots, I guess, you know, putting this Rubenesque stuff all over you. And it's gorgeous, but it's a little too gorgeous. And if you go in the Protestant Europe, you, you have no religious art. And so the all poor artists are out of work. There's nothing to do. There's no more commissions. They get start to be like we are, you know, poor. And please love me and buy me, and, you know, <laughs> and ad admit me into your house, even though I'm nothing but an old dumb artist. <laughs> so that comes a little later. But it started it, in Protestantism now. So they all moved to England. They became portrait artists. Most of them, uh, Holbein and uh, Van Dyck and. and uh, Reynolds and all those great portraits in the Protestant part. And in the Catholic part, it became what you see in the Royal Guard. Right? Mm -hmm. So it becomes very emotional. So I'm go back to my original theme. Is every time there's a theory about art, it kind of matches the art that you're looking at. So Plato came off the idea of the imitation of nature because he was looking at stuff like the Venus de Milo. And St. Thomas came up with, no, it's not an imitation of nature, because he was looking at symbolic art that was illustrating his uh, faith. And in the Baroque period, they come up and say, art is an expression of emotion, because the art becomes very emotional, whether it becomes subjective like Rembrandt, where he paints his own death, really, in incredible uh, self-portraits of Rembrandt at every point in his life. And, and it gets older and older and older, and, and, th and that's subjectivity. Right? That's that's modern in, in that sense. So that was the next one, right? And am I? How long am I going to go? These people are going to faint. You know, have to bring us up to now. <laughs> Anybody can be. I mean, I'm getting. I don't want to get the hook. <laughs> no, you still have time before that comes out. Okay. Are we ready? We still have another half a day. The next one was the Enlightenment in Germany and France with Voltaire and so. And the art is Rococo. It's late Baroque, and you think of Versailles as a Rococo palace, you know, meaning very embellished, very much like box music is very embellished. It's the same period. And the great, great thinker, Immanuel Kant, went one better than Descartes and wrote a book called The Critique of Pure Reason. And according to Hegel, who comes after him, uh, he wrote the first rational word on aesthetics. And Kant is, it's an amazing book. He wrote three critique of pure reason, which shows the limitation of reason. He said that uh, we only, whatever we know, whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. So we can't talk about knowing things in themselves. 
we only know things as they appear to us. And he invented the word phenomena, which all scientists now still use. They don't even know it comes from Kant, some of them, but it does. The appearance of things. But we, you're not inside the molecule, right? You're getting a pattern in mathematics that matches what you think is a pattern out there. So he wrote that one to show the limits of reason. And he proves that you can't prove the existence of God. And of course, everybody went crazy. A heretic, Burnham, even everything. But then he wrote another book and brings God back. Because he says that art is, I mean, uh, man is not just a thinking being, he's a willing being. So he said, when you get into the realm of morals, what I ought to do, or not ought to do, I'm not really in the scientific realm. Because in science, if it's A, then B, right? If it's raining, the streets are wet. If I do such and such, the thing will blow up, right? And you, you, you prove it. In morals, should I go on longer, or should I go along with my wife's indications that I should wrap this up? No. <laughs> it's a should thing, and that's not scientific. It's, a, it's if A, then B, or C. And after the fact, if you don't do what you ought to do, whatever you think that is, you feel guilty. So curiously, guilt, which everybody's trying to get rid of, is really a good thing. It's guilt that reveals freedom and therefore makes it possible to be moral. Because you don't have any direct experience of freedom. You only have the, the, the feeling of guilt. Before you say, I ought to or I shouldn't, I should or I shouldn't, and after you said, I, I should have, but I didn't. So this whole realm is different, and he looks around at the world and said, there's so much suffering that if we didn't believe in a afterlife of some kind, we'd go nuts. So we make God up. But he comes to the different c conclusion than Nietzsche, who says we make him up, therefore he doesn't exist. Kant says we make him up, therefore he, he might. <laughs> because why do we make him up? And then he said we make God as the one to create justices in another world. But I don't want to go there. The third book is where I want to go, which is on aesthetics. It's called The mm -hmm. Critique of uh, Judgment, but it's really The Critique of Aesthetic Judgment. And he said, "There's we make only three kinds of judgments. Scientific, it's true or it's false. Moral, it's good or it's bad and beautiful. And we make them all the time. Beautiful or ugly. Yuck. And he says, <laughs> this indicates in us, right, this ability to judge this, a whole other realm, realm of aesthetics. So we're out of science, we're out of the realm of morals, we're into the realm of what people call beauty. And it has something to do with feeling. But he asked this wonderful question which everybody asks. I, people say when they see a picture, they, you, you've heard it all your life. Right? I know what I like. right? Because really, when it comes to taste, you're the world's arbiter. Who's going to argue with you? Like a little boy who came to dinner once, and we had oysters, and I said, when I was a kid, and my mother said, do you want another oyster? Sure. I don't like the one I have in my mouth. He couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't swallow the thing, but you, you don't have to. You don't have to be. Uh, uh, no, but you're the world expert on how you feel. But, so when you say I like it, let's take this, right? And you say I like it. No argument. I don't like it. It stinks. A monkey could do it. You know, what, who, why did you think this was art? Didn't you go to school, for God's sake? I could do that. There's no argument. You either like it or you don't. But if you go further, note this, this is very important, and say, ah, it stinks. You're going from an individual thing, I like it, to a universal, the form of language. Critics, 
Right? It's a good painting, it's a stinky painting. It's a great performance, it's a lousy performance. We're all critics. And this whole thing of judge not, you won't be judged. We're judging machines. We go around the world saying it's true or it's false, it's good or it's bad, it's ugly or it's beautiful. And we can't help it. But Kant goes deeply into this. And he said that the real reason for this feeling of beauty that we have when we're in the presence of something that, that gives us a good emotional reaction is that somehow this image, created image, is a visual or sensual thing which rings a bell with our intelligence. So he said, we're, we feel pleased because we have intelligence and we have imagination. And when they're in harmony, it gives us a feeling of pleasure. And he called that aesthetic pleasure. So he said, what the artist is trying to do is create a beautiful object. And basically, he opens the door to any kind of formal art because he said, all art for him is composition. It's the arrangement of certain elements which are so arranged that somehow when you see it, you see order. If I tore up a piece of paper, you know garbage when you see it. And you walk into a mess, you know it. No one has to tell you. And you start ordering things. It's the mind of man. So when you order something in a sensuous way that's pleasant, he said, it rings a bell. And you get this aesthetic emotion. So he said, when people say art, he goes back to Plato's definition. And he says, is art really the imitation of nature? And he said, no, it's the opposite. Nature is the imitation of art in the judgment of it as beautiful or ugly. Example, when you see a beautiful sunset, I did, right, when I saw it, I said, oh, that looks like a picture, and I made a picture. What kind of proof do you have that anybody made that there just for your pleasure? So he says, your art is strange, because you're satisfied with the mere contemplation of it. You don't want to eat it, you don't want to go to bed with it. You might want to own it, but then it's a mixed judgment if it's worth value. Right? But the fact is, you don't want to, you want to keep a certain distance, and you want you get pleasure of it by the pure contemplation of it. So it's very different, right? It's a semblance. It's not real. It's taking you in a, into another realm. And that's very, very interesting, and I could go on and on with it, but I, I won't finish the lecture if I do. So Kant says, when people go out and they say, oh, right now it's for the tree. It looks just like a picture. Just like a picture. <laughs> what you're doing is you're attributing it as if it were there just for your pleasure. God, the divine artist. So the fact is, art, uh, nature imitates art. What you're doing when you look at nature is you're making it into art, he said. And uh, so art is not the imitation of nature. Right? It's the creation of an object which gives you this aesthetic emotion. Hegel, the next guy, goes further and says, yeah, but why? Uh, and how come this it changes different styles? And yes, it's got something to do with nature. You might start there. And I can't go through it. I don't have time today. Maybe there'd be another lecture. I want to get to my definition that art is the nature reborn through the free consciousness of the human spirit. So if you take sunflowers, they're beautiful. You see, a, they inspired Van Gogh. And when you see Van Gogh's, wow. They also inspired Monet, another wow. I've done some, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> We all have the same experience, right? but they're very, very different. And what makes it valuable, and the content of it, isn't the sunflower. It's the artist, right? the, spirit, the, the, the incarnation, if you will, of the artist's own reaction. Artists are 
the special feelers. They have special kinds of a way to somehow express, and, and if they do it right, then it might have a resonance with you, because I haven't succeeded unless someone, at least one person, says, wow. And it can be, one can do it. I mean, Van Gogh didn't have any recognition, but his brother did. He did get some. And Van Gogh thought he was pretty good too, but he was nuts. <laughs> made it hard to deal with. In any case, Kant said that we have no access to reality except through consciousness. Hegel goes further and says, but the most real thing is consciousness. And he says that art is nature reborn through the free consciousness of the human spirit. So it's nature come into me, or into Da Vinci, or into Van Gogh, or into Nancy, or into anybody, right, all the artists here, and does some, and you feel, you put it out, and it's reborn, and it's free, it, it, it indicates a whole other world, and he said, this world is our world, and if you ask the question, why art, which people do, it's a, and I always say the same thing, and it's right out of Hegel, right, if you took all of the art away from the world, all of it. No painting, no sculpture, no architecture, no music, no theater, no dance, no literature, because poetry is also art, words used in an artistic way. Right? What a, a boring place we'd be in. We wouldn't feel at home. Right? And, and you know like kids go to the university <coughs> and they get into a dorm, they immediately try to arrange it. Every one of you has a home and every one of your homes is an expression of your aesthetic, of your being. Right? And that really is architecture. Architecture is not the outside of the building. That's a big sculpture. It's being inside right? that's architecture. You're in an art gallery now. And it's a different feeling than if you were in a church or a garage or somewhere else. And that's going through you. Well, the big question, the only one left, and where I wanted to go today, and I will end with this, is after Kant and Hegel, there was a great German thinker named Ernst Gassira. He was Jewish and persecuted by Adolf, who, of course, was a very bad artist and, <laughs> uh, and hated all modern art and thought that, you know, well, he was nuts. But anyway, Gassira was uh, in the whole German tradition agreed with Kant and, 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 and Hegel in, in this aesthetic, but he said that they missed one thing. They didn't ask the question, and nobody asked it, as I, as I, I, I believe you can check me out, until Ernst Basira and his disciple, a woman whose name was Suzanne Langer, who was taught here in America but was a disciple of Ernst Basira, wrote a book called Philosophy in a New Key, and then a wonderful book called Feeling and Form, which you can still get, but it's rare. And she took us here and applied it to art, because he says, what is created in, in a work of art? I mean, I can't create the, I didn't create the wood that made under the stretcher, or, or the canvas, or the paint, or anything. I just took some stuff from one place, arranged it in another place to express something. And she said, you have to do that to express something. You have to make crazy space, virtual space, semblance. Otherwise, it's not expressive. It's nature still. Nature can be expressive in its own way. But to make art, you have to create another world. And he said, we people talk about thought without any symbols, but it's impossible. You try to think, you think most of the time in words, scientists most of the time in mathematics and words, but artists think in sensuous stuff, right? In paint, in stone, in glass, 
in sounds, right? and they re rearrange these so that they're symbolic. But symbolic of what? So, my definition, I think I have it memorized, says part of the creation, and it really is creation, because I'm, I'm not, you know, not that, uh, not going around, you know, blowing my own horn, but before that, but I made that, it didn't exist, that image. I didn't make anything, there are no new molecules or, or, or atoms or, or anything. I just made this symbol, and it's symbolic because it, it's mere illusion. There is no such place. It's nature that there is a place that I took it from. It's a bridge in Montreal, which is near where we live in France, and it inspired me. But I, it doesn't look like that. That's a memory of Sharp, but it doesn't look like it, it, the feeling I have of it. So she said, "Art is the creation of forms." Because that's all you can create, one way or the other, in music, any of the arts. Symbolic, that is, that point to something else. Right? Symbolic of what? She says a feeling. And yes, that's true, my feeling, that, but I, I don't think that's adequate. I think what she should have said is, art is uh, creation of forms. Symbolic of human experience, right? of what? Of nature, as that one was. Of society, human relations, like in great plays, like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which reveal ourselves to ourselves. Sounds and music, the most revelatory of all. It's, it almost seems like it's the incarnation of feeling. It's got so much you, and it brings you with it as it does a dance, which she has a wonderful chapter, says it's great virtual powers, that is, it's about attraction and repulsion. Of, and that's why a lot of it's erotic, because the most uh, deepest experience we have is sex of feeling. So a lot of it's very, very erotic dance, because you're using bodies. And she then goes into uh, literature, and shows that you use words there to express feeling, you're using them in a totally different way. For example, if I said, if I say in discursive language, the moon is made of green cheese, I'm sorry, prove it, right? And you can disprove it. But you can say all sorts of things scientists can about what making the moon. Right? And you're learning something, but you're not feeling it. But when Blake looked at the moon, he said, Thou fair-haired angel of the evening, now while the sun rests on the mountains, light thy bright torch of love. Thy radiant crown put on and shine upon our evening beds. He didn't tell you anything about what's it's scientific about the moon, but wow, what a feeling. Right? So this whole creation of forms that are symbolic, I say of nature, of social relations, and I add, because of my own predilection, I guess, but my, my conviction, of evolution, of evolving culture. What is culture? We all have one, right? We're in American culture. It's different than French culture. It's different than Haitian culture. It's different than Chinese culture. It's all the arts put together plus philosophy and religion. That's what it is, right? And all of them hang together. And they create this world in which we feel at home. This isn't a created world. We did it. Uh, in France, but usually once one, one that I teach in this program for kid, American kids there. A lot of them from the south, and they get to France, and they have culture shock. The food tastes different. The water's different. Right? Uh, we we've all experienced it at one time or another, and it takes a while to adapt to that. Right? So culture is the air you breathe, right? And it's all created by art. Philosophy is thinking of is also in it, but at at the end. But religion too, for most of us, but not for all of us anymore. In any case, the world we live in is culture. So I think that the artist creates forms 
which are symbolic. That is, they, the painting should lead outside of itself, right? but not necessarily to that bridge. It should lead maybe to your own experience of a sunset. Uh, it should always lead you to another world. And it's like Alice going through the looking glass. Why do we frame pictures? Because it makes it absolutely clear this had nothing to do with this room. Right? Inside there is my world. Different world. And that's... Uh, I, I, I really love art because I... You know, everybody's saying always face reality, but you know...